So this, this talk is entitled Social Theory of Freedom of Expression. So it's intended to explain the societal origin and reason for freedom of expression and the reasons why freedom of expression itself as a right is, is often attacked. So it's, it's intended to give uh, a deep and fundamental understanding, theoretical understanding of, of what that's about. That, that's, that's the goal of the talk. And so um, I want to start by thanking the U uh, Ottawa Cinema Academica for hosting the talk. Uh, they're, they're a wonderful organization and they, they host a discussion and a film every week here at the University of Ottawa. And I want to thank the Ontario Civil Liberties Association for co-sponsoring the talk. They're a new organization in Ottawa. They're now five years old. And I'm actually a researcher with the Ontario Civil Liberties Association. And through that work, I've learned a lot about freedom of expression, and I've learned a lot about the various ways that freedoms of all kinds and civil rights are oppressed by governments and uh, associations. And I've had the occasion to talk on the phone to victims of that oppression, if you like. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting some insight into how broad this problem is and, and how, how serious it is. And so one of, one, that's one of the things that motivates me is I want to uh, impress on society and the people who might see this, this video and all of you how important freedom of expression is, how, just how fundamental it is. And, so, and lastly, I want to thank you all for, for being here, for coming out. Uh, normally, I, I was trained as a, as a physicist in, in the hard sciences. And, uh, but I've moved into making a lot of commentary in anthropology, and sociology, and psychology, and medicine, and things like that. And th this talk is going to be more along those lines. Um, previously, I've given two talks as part of the Cinema Academica series. I, I tend to give, I, I, I give one every year or so. And the, the last two that I gave, there was one on climate, and there was one on medicine and things related to medicine. Oh, I think we just had a camera problem there. Um, Cameras everywhere. God. I want to just uh, look at that. Move oh, over there to get away from Sorry, I didn't know it was. Oh, no problem. Are we good? Sorry about that. Sure. Yeah. Oh, this is an example that freedom has two sides. So the, the last two talks I gave, as I said, were on climate and medicine, and they were they, they, they were long talks, uh, and they were uh, and there are articles associated with those talks, and so you can find links to all my works and articles on my blog, which is called Activist Teacher. And you can also look at my ResearchGate uh, researcher profile if you want to find that. And also another good place is my author page at the electronic journal called Dissident Voice. So those are places where you can learn about my work. So today, getting into the topic now, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to say that Human societies have always been, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a very short summary of the talk before we start. I'm actually going to more or less read this summary to make sure that you have a clear picture of where we're going uh, in, in my presentation. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to be saying that um, real human societies have always been organized following the same principle, and that is dominance hierarchy and that there is an evolutionary advantage for the species to do that. So I'm going to be saying that these, these other models which theorists tend to develop and adopt, such as capitalism, socialism, even anarchy, uh, libertarianism, that these are all idealized models that tend to be just reflections of what we would like or what we would prefer but they're not really grounded in the reality of dominance hierarchy that I'm going to explain today. Um, and I'm going to say how we establish these dominance hierarchies, what stabilizes them, what is it about our human nature that, that is such that, that they come about and that they're created and that they're... Um, what, and then I'm going to talk about the difficulty, the internal difficulties when you try to maintain a society along, along the lines of a dominance hierarchy, what happens 
uh, what are some of the problems with it, because there are some conflicts between the individual and the dominance hierarchy. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about how all of this means that society is unavoidably constantly in flux. There's things happening all the time. There's a constant struggle. And um, the, it, so, so society is constantly harming itself even and repairing itself. And this is necessarily the way it is. And it's, it's, it's a lot like uh, the human body. Um, there are repair mechanisms and there's constant harm coming to it and sometimes there's autoimmune attacks on the body itself. It's a, it's a lot like that. So I'm going to be describing that in some detail. Um, I'm going to talk about the institutions that uh, are created to uh, enforce and to structure this dominance hierarchy. And I'm going to talk about how these institutions, how, how through these institutions we create laws and rules that uh, we force each other or we force some classes to abide by and so on. I'm going to talk about how that arises and eventually get to the idea that even fundamental, what we consider to be fundamental rights like a free expression, free association, um, are just a set of these rules and why they're more fundamental than some of the other rules that, that regulate, for example, economic exchanges and so on. <coughs> and I'll explain the difference between good rules or laws and bad rules or laws. So uh, this is just this idea, I'm, I'm using the words good and bad, but what I mean by that is that some laws actually destabilize the dominance hierarchy and therefore destabilize society. They're bad laws in the sense that they're, they're not consistent with the, the evolutionary advantage of having a dominance hierarchy. And good laws are ones that uh, strengthen and repair the dominance hierarchy. And so that gives us a theoretical way of distinguishing uh, what is a good law and what is a bad law. If, if you're designing a society that's going to be fair and that's going to operate for a long time. And then I'm going to explain um, the system logic of this dominance hierarchy, um, where there are social engineering strategies at work, and these are called, sometimes they're referred to as equity, multiculturalism, bilingualism, uh, political correctness is another one of these principles. And I'm going to explain how these principles are, on the one hand, necessary, but on the other hand, can run away and become pathological. Um, so I'm going to try to give the, the theoretical origin of some of these phenomena that we observe in society and that we debate and that we get angry about. Um, I'll describe areas of, so, so one set of these laws is in relation to expression and freedom of speech. So I'll describe some of these laws uh, and I'll talk about them, for example, blasphemy laws, uh, hate crime laws. Um, defamation, civil defamation law, and so on, and explain that these are laws, these are bad laws in the way that they're designed and written on the books in our society presently because they remove a repair mechanism from the dominance hierarchy and that therefore they destabilize society. Um, so I'm going to explain that. And so the, the whole idea is that I'll be giving a, a theoretical structure that allows one to sort of sort these things out, decide and, and to understand why these things happen and how to make judgments about what is, what is a good direction to go in and what is a not so good direction to go in. Um, and then, of course, at, at the end of my presentation, um, I'll, I'll expect you to challenge me with questions and challenge some of these ideas. I'm sure there's a lot of things I'll be saying that, uh, that almost all of you, there'll be something that you'll disagree with or be upset about or whatever, so we can discuss it <clears throat> in the discussion period. And that's a characteristic of these Cinema Academica discussions. Is there's a lot of discussion at the end, kind of free, free for all. Um, so as the as first part of the talk, then, I want to try to answer the question. I want to prove or try to convince you of this idea of a dominance hierarchy. And um, <clears throat> I guess the best proof is if you just, if we look around, um, at society, and wherever there are humans, and at any time in our human history, there has always been hierarchy and fights to establish hierarchy. 
That's a constant. It's a historic constant. It's a reality of what we observe. If you deny that, or if you, if you think that, we, that things could be any other way, in a sense, you're, you're being academic, you're being theoretical. It's, it wouldn't be, if you had that kind of a belief, it wouldn't be consistent with observation, is what I would argue. So as a result of this, um, it turns out that as individuals, we don't primarily want freedom. More than anything, because we live and we're brought up in this dominance hierarchy, this is a general statement. Individuals are different one to the other. But as a general statement, we want to be oppressed fairly. That's what we want. We want to be oppressed <laughs> fairly. Yep. More than we want freedom. Okay? So I'll give you an example from when I was teaching at the university. If you ask students what bothers them most, they'll tell it's not it's not that they're being controlled and forced to do things through the instrument of grading. They don't care that much about that. You know, they, 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 they figure that's, that's fair. And it's not so much that they're adults and they're not being paid for this very difficult work that they're being forced to do. They don't seem to mind about that at all. They don't see it as work. Okay? They, 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 so these are not things that they care that much about. As perplexing as that may be, seem to be to someone who looks at this from the outside. But the one thing they will get very angry about, and get very upset about, and the one thing they'll talk about it, that angers them to hell, is how they were unfairly graded on this or that assignment, or unfairly graded in this course. If they're unfairly graded, or they feel they have been, they will get very, very angry. So this, this kind of is an illustration of this principle that we want to be oppressed fairly more than we want freedom. Um, one of the most brilliant social theorists ever, I think, a man, a man I admire very much who has died, is, is Paulo Freire. And in his classic, famous book, he explains a method for trying to figure out how society works. What are the relations of power, dominance, oppression, in society. He explains that this is very difficult to see. He explains that, uh, for example, a, a slave will not see themselves as a slave, generally speaking. They'll think of the master as someone who takes care of them, who is fair to them, who, who, who organizes the work, and so on. Generally speaking, slave-like structures can survive for a long, long time because slaves had come to adopt this, this view of themselves. Um, and so Paulo Ferreira tried to devise a way for observers to try and figure out what was going on. And what he suggested was to send out observers into the community and to try and figure out what are the things, what language do they use? What are the things they say? What are the important images for them that are clues to what's really going on here that you might reflect back on them to show them, to help them see it for themselves? And so if we apply that technique, just in a little example now, um, one of the things you hear a lot, and that makes us chuckle, is this saying that Benjamin Franklin used to say some 200 years ago, and that people before him said, and that I think we've always said something equivalent to this, which is that there are only two things that are certain, death and taxes. That's a very profound statement, if, if you see it as such, right? Death like we're individuals, there's the reality of our bodies, of our lives, of what we need to stay alive, that's a certainty. And taxes, we're ingrained in some kind of a hierarchical system, and that system will be extracting resources from us, will be charging us money, will be, will be, will be uh, forcing us to contribute within a system, within an organized system. So I think that, that is a profound statement that tells us about this very real situation that we're in. So, if we accept for now, for the sake of argument, that we do live in a dominance hierarchy, irrespective of what we call it and how the, the details of how we see it, then the next question is, why? Why would humans 
organize themselves in a dominance hierarchy where there's people above them telling them what to do, and there's people underneath, and there's, there's, there's uh, rules about how you have to behave and what you have to do. Why would you do that as a species? Well, um, the main reason, I believe, one of the driving factors is security and safety. Mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is, if you look at the history of, of animal and human societies, plus human societies, you will find that historically people have died much more frequently from violent wars than in the present. That, that more, less developed hierarchical systems are more violent. And there is a, an important area of study that argues this point. This is one of the books, uh, early book, that, uh, that argued this point in some detail. It's called War Before Civilization, The Myth of the Peaceful... Whoops, well, that was good. Uh, the Myth of the Peaceful Savage. And it's by a, name, uh, a fellow named Lawrence Keeley. So it, it makes a really good case for this point. And, of course can't have that. So it's based on um, archaeological observations, uh, uh, evidence of how people died, the number of males to females there were in, in societies depending on their habits and so on. It's, it's, it's based on this kind of evidence and he argues the point very strongly and it's very convincing when you read it. Now since then, in more recent times, to be fair, it's, it's a whole area of study. So there's a bunch of authors, and this is an edited collection of the authors that would argue that's not quite true. It depends. There are societies that were primitive or less developed, but they weren't violent and so on. So there's all kinds of discussion about this. But overall, I have come to the conclusion that mostly when you're not in a highly stratified, organized hierarchy, you're at a, a much higher risk of being invaded killed, taken out, having, having your family members stolen from you, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. okay? So, there's an advantage to the individual to be in a dominance hierarchy, and that's safety. So that kind of explains it. So it's, 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 there's this trade-off, security versus autonomy, okay? You agree to play your part, you agree to take a government job with job security and a pension, as opposed to being self-employed and having much more freedom. A lot of people make that choice. So there's, there's, this, there's this decision, for, for example, in, in the field of academics. At one point, we, the universities needed to find a way to attract and keep university professors because uh, they were hard to find. This is back in the boom after the Second World War. There was a lot of students, a lot, and you couldn't find enough of these highly qualified intellectuals to be professors, so you had to find a way to attract them. What was the most effective way to get them into the universities as opposed to just being on their own, writing articles and making money from publishing books and all of this? It was to offer them tenure and so-called academic freedom. If you gave them job security, they, they wanted it. They, they would be willing to sit there and teach on schedule and do all these things that you wanted them to do if you gave them job security. So there's a, there's a brilliant history. If you look at the history of tenure and academic freedom, that's entirely what it was. Now the trade-off was that you had academic freedom to give academic opinions, but you could not get into politics. You could not say things that were relevant to real issues in the political world. That was a no-no. And so that was the trade-off. And so this is happening all the time. So that's, that's the reason that, that's the evolutionary reason that we have dominance hierarchy. The next question is, how does it work? In the sense of, how can something based on dominance uh, be very stable and operate for long periods of time. How, how can this work? Well, one of the first important kind of building blocks of how this works is based on the individual's self-identity. Once you've been brought up in a dominance hierarchy, and once you've got your place in that dominance hierarchy, your own personal identity 
is intimately tied to your place in the dominance hierarchy. So you come to see yourself as you identify with the class that you're in. You identify with the profession that you've chosen. You identify with the work group that you're part of. You identify in this way. And so therefore, your, your status in society is tied to your place in the dominance hierarchy. So once you, once you tie the individual's identity in this way, uh, you've got a very stable structure because each individual is going to want to maintain their identity and not lose it and not risk losing it. So that, that's, a, that's a very um, a stable system. Um, that identity is related to individual health, very much so. Um, you can show, and I know that there's a researcher in the room who has shown this in her uh, uh, graduate work, but one can show that if you lose the signs of your identity, if you lose the structure, if you lose uh, your job, for example, if you lose things that, that threaten your identity of how you see yourself and your place in the world, that has a devastating effect on your individual health. One of the most devastating effects imaginable is to lose your position, to lose your status, to not have the status you, you grew up thinking you should have. That's a devastating thing for, for our human health. So that's, that's, that's another kind of driving, stabilizing force that it shows you how important identity is and how it's tied to the hierarchy. Um, there's another mechanism that stabilizes dominance hierarchy. So that, that was one mechanism in relation to the identity of the individual. There's another one, and it's this. There are scientific studies uh, of animals, monkeys, rodents, etc. There's, there's a whole area of research that shows that individuals in an animal society, they're at the, that are at the bottom of a dominance hierarchy, are generally have a much lower life expectancy and are sick more often than the individuals that are dominating them, generally speaking, as a general rule. There, there's, there's also examples of where leaders of packs fight among themselves, and so they, they, they can suffer some health problems too. But generally speaking, if you're constantly being aggressed through dominance interactions and reminded of your lower place in the hierarchy and have food stolen from you and et cetera, et cetera, the, the, the stress from that, from those interactions, purely the stress, causes you physiologically to be more susceptible to disease. And so I have argued in my book that because of that, which is well established, um, the lower strata individuals will not be able to defend themselves. They'll not be able to organize. They'll not be able to imagine and fight for a more just or fair society. So in a sense, that stabilizes dominance. It helps to stabilize it, okay? So these are two of the factors that I've identified that answer the question, how? How does this happen? Why would it be this way? The next question relating to dominance hierarchy um, is by what methods does this complicated hierarchy get constructed? And so the methods are, first and foremost, institutions in human societies, institutions. So we're talking about government, religion, legal systems, corporations as a legal entity, the family unit, schools, all of these things. These, each one of these institutions is, is structured in a way that it has the purpose to define and stabilize the dominance hierarchy. And so each one of these institutions is, is a, this dynamic uh, body that is adapting to maintaining that, that, that hierarchy despite population growth, despite developments in technology, despite all these changes that are happening constantly, the institutions will um, do everything they can to survive themselves because there's individuals within those institutions whose status is tied to them and so on, and they will adapt to maintain this overall hierarchy. The second kind of methods related element is technology. And there's two kinds of technology that are relevant to 
being able to create and maintain a large dominance hierarchy. The first is the technology that relates to projection of power. So we're talking about military technology. We're talking about inventing steel weapons, steel, the use of steel, uh, being able to deliver projectiles, uh, eventually nuclear weapons, aircraft carriers. What could be a more advanced technology than to be able to take an entire air force, bigger than the air force of most countries, by way of the oceans to any place on earth to uh, get a smaller nation to understand that you're serious about wanting them to whatever, okay? So there's uh, aircraft carriers. So that's projection of power technology. And obviously the other technology that's relevant is uh, the, the technology that shrinks the world. So we're talking about mass communications, interpersonal communications, transportation, and I would add the internet and search engines, the ability to, to know the world quickly, be able to find things quickly. That, I mean, that has been a revolution. Uh, when I started doing research as a graduate student, I was spending hours and hours in the library looking through books and indexes and, 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 and having to use keywords in, 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 in books of keywords and, and things like that manually. So my research supervisor showed me how to do scientific research in a library using these darn books of indices and so on. So I mean, you, you would spend half your time in the freaking library pulling out books and putting them back. And then putting them back in the wrong places and then someone can't find them and et cetera. <laughs> but so the, Google and the internet has really transformed the world and I think has shrunk it, has shrunk our ability to, to uh, see the world as a whole. The next question related to dominance hierarchy is when does it occur? Under what conditions does it occur? Kind of when and historically, or under what conditions? And um, we're getting some uh, wild uh, feedback. Oh, we got a feedback loop. Okay. It's because we're. Uh, too much technology isn't a good thing. It's really annoying. Yeah, I think we're going to have some. So basically, uh, you're picking up a signal on a microphone, and you're playing it back, and so you create this loop, this positive feedback, and it just blows up. You get this, you get, you get this uh, infinite gain, and you get what's, what just happened there. So that's that's a pathological reaction. We're gonna we're gonna see that in a minute, but in a societal system. Okay. So um, getting back to this, where was I? Yeah. The last question about dominance hierarchy is. When does it occur? And so I want to talk about a theoretical model of dominance hierarchy. Um, Joseph Hickey, who's sitting there in the room, is doing his PhD on a theoretical model of dominance hierarchies. Okay? And um, it's a PhD in physics. And so he's using physical modeling to look at this. And so what he does is, and I, I, I've had the, uh, I, I've been fortunate enough to, to hear about this, and he's been telling me about it, so I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, this is unpublished stuff, so you're getting the, an advanced view of this. It turns out that what he does is he considers a society of individuals who at first are all equal, and he lets them fight. 
two at a time. So he picks two individuals and lets them fight. And when they fight, one will be a winner and the other will be the loser. And so they will exchange this quantity, which he calls status. The winner will receive some status. The loser will lose that amount of status. Okay? And there are two parameters that define how this fight is going to happen. One is how much status will be exchanged in the fight. So that is a representation of how violent the fight is, of, of how intense it is. That's his parameter delta, I think he calls it. And then there's another parameter in the fight, which is how probable is it that the person with higher status will win the uh, fight? You want that? You want me to unplug it? OK. So then the question is, so you've got two parameters defining these fights. How much status is exchanged? How violent the fight is? And what is the probability that the person with the highest status will win the fight? If just a little bit higher status almost guarantees that you'll win the fight, we would call that an authoritarian system. If, it, if the relative status doesn't really matter, that's a very egalitarian system. So he's got a parameter that runs from egalitarian all the way to very authoritarian. And so he draws a diagram, which is um, oh, the blackboard's away over there. OK. So he, he, he basically draws a diagram and looks at what kind of society evolves from this, if you just let the system go on its own. And what happens is a society self-organizes itself, and you get a distribution of statuses in society. If the society is very violent and very authoritarian, the, the, the system very quickly goes to a totalitarian society in which one individual has all the power, all the status, and everyone else has zero status. You very quickly go there. If you have <coughs> low values of authoritarianism and violence of the fights, then you get a stable society where there's this distribution of status. There's a middle class, there's a working class, and so on. You can imagine it that way, right? And so this, I think, is giving us the first picture, theoretically, of that it's the nature of these fights that will determine the kind of society that will arise. And therefore, we imagine, we can imagine that the institutions are going, and the laws and rules that we have are going to be regulating the nature of these fights between whether they're corporations or individuals or whatever. So how violent are they allowed to be? You know, how much money do you lose in a given fight, in a given lawsuit or whatever? And what is the probability that you're going to win the fight with respect to your status relative to the other, to the other, to the opponent? And so once you start seeing it that way, you start to see that a lot of societies rules and regulations and so on are set up to put us in a place of this societal phase diagram, if you like, where society is stable. Otherwise, if you move out of those values of how fights occur, you move into an unstable totalitarian state. And one of the very interesting predictions of, of um, um, Joseph Hickey's work is that most of the time, societies are always creeping towards totalitarianism. <laughs> so, so for most of the values of these parameters, the, the system is very slowly, the, 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 the society is metastable. It's stable for a long time, but it's creeping towards totalitarianism. Um, and so it, it's, it's giving us, a, this, this physics calculation is giving us a view of this. So that would answer the question, when does it happen? Under what circumstances can you stabilize it, you see? So there, there is maybe a theoretical answer to that. OK. That was the part of the talk where I explained dominance hierarchy. Now I'm moving into the third part of the talk where I want to talk about the oppressive nature of hierarchy and the individual's pushback against that oppression. Okay. Now, when I talk about, <laughs> actually, my, my, my wife 
was looking at my notes as I was scribbling them out, and she, she looked over my shoulder at one point, and she said, do you ever give a talk where you don't use the word oppression? <laughs> That's pretty funny. That was physics. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> um, so a lot of students, if you talk about oppression and that the system's oppressing them, they'll get very angry at you. I actually uh, was in a class one time where the students got very upset at the idea that I would suggest that they were oppressed, because they, right, because they chose to be there, and they paid their tuition, and they were getting something out of it, and it was not oppression, fine. <laughs> I don't want to fight, but there are, generally speaking, dominance hierarchies um, are oppressive. And the, what I mean by that is, I think, the, I think that one of the best theorists, again, who explain this, how dominance hierarchies are oppressive is Paulo Ferreira in his book, uh, Pedagogy of Liberation. Basically, that's one title of it, yeah. Uh, basically, um, if you have a hierarchy, the system is going to put limits on your freedom, okay? And so, as a result, as an individual, you're going to feel like uh, violated somewhat from that. You're going to feel less freedom. And therefore, you're going to oppose that. So there's going to be some resistance from the individual. Um, if you look at the symbolism that's used nowadays on the internet and so on, you'll find that some libertarians and people who are feeling oppressed by what they call collectivism uh, will uh, point out that I, I saw this picture on the internet of a multi-headed dragon called collectivism and the various heads are called communism, socialism, uh, social justice, nationalism, fascism and so on and the, 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 the dragon is, this is what it looks like Okay. And the dragon is attacking a, a Roman warrior who's called individualism, and he's defending himself with a sword and a shield, right? And this is a very, I think this is a very realistic picture of what's happening. The only thing I would add is I would add a head to that dragon, which is called, uh, which I would call what we generally call capitalism. How is capitalism, as we understand what's going on today in the world, not collectivism? I mean, it's completely regulated by laws that give rights to corporations. It's got a whole set of rules. I mean, it's, it's part of, it's just a manifestation of collectivism. So I would put all of those systems as oppressive against the individual and have the individual uh, defend himself against those things. So that's what I want to talk about is that defense. Um, So basically, the individual freedom has kind of two components. If you, if you want individual freedom, if you want individual liberation and so on, if you want freedom, part of that means you want safety. You want to be able to live, you want to be able to, you want to have freedom to believe, to express, and to be in safety. But it's much more than that because there's another component which is, and this is the one that's downplayed by society's institutions a lot, the other component of freedom is you want to have influence in society. You want to somewhat project yourself and have influence and be involved in politics and so on. Uh, you want to even, you know, dominate in a sense at your level in, in your immediate environment. There, that's part of freedom as well. So what you find is that each person has kind of plays between three poles of what they would like. They want security, they want procreation, generally, as a general rule, and they want influence, which has a component of domination, where they can, they can benefit from playing a role in the hierarchy. So you, 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 you move between those poles as an individual. You make a sacrifice, you may sacrifice one or two of those poles to get security if you feel that's what you need most right now. You may sacrifice some security to uh, get more influence. 
you may say, I don't care about anything else but my kids and my family. And so you sacrifice everything else uh, for the procreation end of things. So this is how the individual is dealing with the oppression that, it is being, that the individual is being subjected to within that dominance hierarchy. So there's always this interplay, therefore, between self-preservation and wanting to have influence. So we've <clears throat> looked at the individual's place in the dominance hierarchy, that the effect of the dominance hierarchy on the individual, how the dominance hierarchy is stabilized, how it's maintained, how it's created, what are the underlying mechanisms that, 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 give, it, that give it real strength and so on, and I want to move into this next part where now I'm going to talk about things that happen within that system, and in particular, spontaneous collective responses against hierarchical oppression. So what I'm talking about now is organized corruption in quotations, okay? So a good example of this is, um, for example, I, I worked in Brazil when I was doing physics a long time ago. And um, Brazil is a nation, so there's this whole hierarchy, there's this whole structure, the military is important, the government's important, and so on. But a lot of people are not getting any benefit from that and go off and live on their own in favelas. And the favelas are controlled by the mob. And this is a very strong structure. And the, the, the military's not going in there. The government's not going in there. They take the electricity, from the leads, and they have electricity, and they take cement, they take what they want, and they build favelas, and they run their own society <coughs> in a parallel society. So if you're in Rio de Janeiro, and you look at the mountain, you see a favela there, you're not going there if you're not part of that. And so when the government wants to make changes to the favelas, or wants to have some of the land and so on, they have to negotiate with the mob bosses. There's no other way. That's what they do. This is, this is what I'm told. So, that's an example of how you can spontaneously create kind of a subsystem as a defense against this larger dominant system. Okay, and that's what I want to talk about now is this idea of corruption. In other words, this kind of corruption is not avoidable. It's a spontaneous consequence of creating a large dominance hierarchy. So you'll get things like tax evasion, You'll get things like uh, black markets, uh, the, the use of bribes. Uh, you'll, you'll get things at the, at the local level. You'll have home industries. You'll have you know, every, every kind of thing you can think of. And this, is, this can be fine, or in some cases, it can be threatening to the dominant hierarchy. It becomes threatening when it's based on class. So, for example, if, if, if a class of individuals or a community of individuals starts to have strong ties and develop their own <coughs> internal economy and develop their own ideas about things and want to have certain demands about things, then the dominant uh, hierarchy needs to break that. They need to wreck it. Okay? And so this is what residential schools were about in Canada. This is what the Children's Aid Society in Canada, in Ontario. I think that's what it's about. I think it's about preventing working in unemployed class families from developing culture and family ties and so on. Go in there, take their children, show them who's boss, all these kinds of things. Um, you, you, police presence and police raids in communities is another example of that. This is happening in Somalian communities in Ottawa. You know, these kinds of very very direct <coughs> disruptions of communities. Uh, prison capture, putting a lot of people from one social class into prison, going and getting the, the young men from that class, putting them in prison well, on, on these charges related to nonviolent offenses and so on. That is a way to wreck community, to make sure they don't organize themselves into working, well, organizations, okay? So uh, another manifestation of, of that wrecking by the dominant hierarchy is uh, framing of important leaders or assassinating them. There's plenty of examples of that in, in U.S. society. 
So that is one response to this dominance hierarchy, where you have this spontaneous arising of collective communities and so on that, that find other ways, and you go in and wreck them if you, if you feel threatened by them. Um, or if you believe, for theoretical reasons, that you are threatened by them, and you go in and wreck them. Um, this, this brings me now to uh, one, of, one of the last parts of my talk, I want to talk about some social phenomena in dominance hierarchy and some social engineering that's occurring within the dominance hierarchy. This is like the fifth part of the talk. I'm going very quickly because I want to leave lots of time for discussion afterwards. Um, so, <clears throat> <clears throat> there are a lot of brilliant theorists have developed models of society. Uh, for example, Adam Smith developed a model called capitalism. When Adam Smith wrote his book about capitalism, I mean, it's, it's a brilliant book. It's, 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 it, he explained how if you allow this freedom to compete, and if you allow that the individual's uh, desire to uh, have influence and to build locally a kind of <coughs> hierarchical system of it, of of uh, progress and so on, that that can be a huge driving force for even a larger scale economy. So Adam Smith's capitalism is, is, is an amazing piece of work, and Adam Smith uh, foresaw that capitalism would be degraded and corrupted by elite forces, by people who would change the rules of the game to their advantage. And um, for example, corporations originally were public corporations, and they were created as entities that were not owned by anyone, and that were simply created temporarily for the public for the public purpose of needing big constructions and things like that, but they quickly became vehicles for a <coughs> class that, that can do a lot of things they would nor normally be able to do with a private enterprise. So Adam Smith foresaw a lot of these problems and warned about them. But nonetheless, it's, it's, it's a beautiful idea. But it's, it's, um, it's an incorrect idea because it does not recognize that this capitalist system which Adam Smith imagined will actually be and turn into a dominance hierarchy in, in, in the, in the in the real sense of how uh, society organizes itself. So he, he foresaw some of it, but not all of it. Another, another brilliant uh, social theory is uh, Karl Marx's uh, theory of socialism, which he described in the Co Communist Manifesto. I, if you read the Communist Manifesto, you can't not be impressed by the intellectual rigor and brilliance of the work. It's completely wrong, of course, in the sense that there's no way you could ever have a stable society like that, where, where, where cadres are motivated by the public good and receive their direction from meetings with, with uh, community members and so on. There's no way that that could ever work because it's just so much at odds with the reality of dominance hierarchy, I would say. Another brilliant theory is um, the theory developed by um, the great anarchists. So it's anarchism. In other words, this idea that you could have a society that is uh, premised on individual freedom and individual uh, impulses to naturally get along with people and do, do what you want to do and so on. So anarchism, libertarianism, and so on. That, that's another one of these idealized <coughs> theories, which I think could never work on the, on the wide scale because you're going to get this dominance hierarchy. And finally, there's another theory of human organization, which some have believed could succeed, which would be, I would call it a, a kind of uh, serfdom totalitarianism. So basically where you have a boss and his immediate surroundings and everyone else is at the ground floor, you know, just, just has nothing and is just working to get by. Kind of a, a, a slavery system with, with, uh, with um, 
the, the master in the White House and everybody else out in the field. So that's, that's this very, very totalitarian system. And that, it turns out, historically, at least in our day and age, and I think in all the historical examples that we know, is unstable. That's not going to last forever. The things, things are going to change. There's going to be, there's, there has to be room for the middle people. So I would say that each of these theories of social organization is an idealization. It, it, it's, it's what the particular theorists would have preferred and would like to see. So it's kind of an expression of where they would like it to be. So if you're, I, I, I would argue from a psychological point of view, if you really feel that you don't have enough freedom that's important to you, you'll tend to, to gravitate towards theories of anarchism and libertarianism. If you really feel that um, the, the, the boss is on your back and can't handle it, you're going to gravitate towards socialism and so on, right? So I think they're, they're, they're um, theories that don't sufficiently take into account our human reality. In other words, paper is paper and people are people. Theories are just theories, but we have to try and find out what, what we're really doing here. All right, so because of this, there are many folks, I just want to mention this as a phenomenon, there are many folks who would like to fix society once and for all, have an ideal system put into place, call it socialism or whatever, and then we can all just rest easy because finally we got it. We just have to work hard, be activists, get involved, get the perfect system in place, and then we'll be okay. And they burn themselves tr out trying to achieve this. Like, they work and work and they, they develop burnout. I mean, they really work hard at it. They, they do activism to improve things and it never gets better. And, the, and so this is, this is, I think, this burnout comes from not visualizing in a realistic way what society is like, some of its basic fundamental features, like in relation to this dominance hierarchy. In other words, you can't put an ideal system into place and expect it to just sit there. It, the, the thing is always going to evolve, and there are all these driving forces towards dominance hierarchy, and they're not going away. That's my point there. Um, I want to talk about another collective behavior. I'm just, now I'm just picking collective behaviors at random that, that occur in dominance hierarchy. Another one is what I would call mobbing. Mobbing is something that animals do, uh, birds, mammals, etc. They find a weak individual that they figure is, I don't know, harming their chance of survival, or for one reason or another, these birds will attack a, a target and kill it. They'll, they'll mob it. Uh, th this is quite common. And so the, it's a whole area of study in animal behavior and in human behavior. And so, what I want to say about mobbing is, and it's very present in our society, what I want to say about mobbing is that it's, it's something that can be good or it can be bad, in the sense of it can stabilize the dominance hierarchy in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good way that gives you the advantages of the dominance hierarchy, or it can destabilize it, okay? So, for example, good, mobbing has names like boycott, strike, um, or reputational exclusion, you know, the Me Too phenomenon. Now, the Me Too phenomenon can run away and become a nasty thing that is bad, but it can also play a role that is very positive, that, uh, that uh, by this reputational mobbing on its own gets certain class or gender of the society to pay attention and to uh, really reconsider their behaviors and so on, right? So these are, these are forms of mobbing where people get together and they, they for example, in a strike, they'll, they'll go after the boss or in a boycott, they'll go after a misbehaving influential target of some kind. So these are, these are I would argue, mobbings that are good in, in the sense that they repair deficiency abuses of the dominance hierarchy, where, where there's too much abuse of power, it's, it therefore destabilizes the system, and so you fix it this way. It's a repair mechanism. It can be bad when the mobbing 
is harmful against the individual's rights. So the dominance hierarchy will give the individual rights. They'll protect the individual. It will protect the individual against egregious abuses of power. So if you remove those rights through a mobbing mechanism, then you're removing some fundamental advantages of the dominance hierarchy. And that's not a good thing. So you get this happening a lot. There is a punisher pathology out there. There's, there's, there's individuals who like to punish, who, who get benefit from punishing through their social ties and so on. And so they can mob individuals, target individuals or, or behaviors in a way that removes their their normal rights, their high-level rights, their fundamental rights within the dominance hierarchy. And that's when it becomes nasty and bad. So that's what I want to say about mobbing. Another, another phenomenon I want to talk about is equity, so-called equity. Equity is the elimination of hierarchy within one strata of the dominance hierarchy. Okay, that's what it is. So, in other words, when you're applying equity, you're saying, I want equity in the workforce. I want all the workers on the work floor, in these cubicles in the government, wherever they are, to be equal. Nobody's going to be the boss of anybody. They're going to have a certain set of equal rights. There's going to be equity, and you enforce it. The, the dominance hierarchy enforces it. That would be equity. That, that equity can go too far. Um, it can run away through this feedback mechanism that we were talking about early, earlier, and it can become absurd. It can become where every little thing has to be, you know, equal and to, to, to the degree, to a degree where it actually harms the system. So you have to distinguish equity and fairness. Fairness is where you eliminate the abuses of the dominance hierarchy that is good for society as a whole. Equity is where the dominance hierarchy is trying to impose an artificial absence of hierarchy within a certain strata. So that, that I think is a way to understand what equity is. So, um, yeah, it, it, can be, it, can be, it can run away and it can become pathological. A, a good example of equity type phenomena in the workplace is in relation to this poster that I brought. I stuck that on the wall earlier. This is a poster that I found in a government building, you know, one of these huge buildings that has cubicles to the end of sight, and where all these uh, uh, civil servants are working away. And on the walls they have various posters telling you uh, you know, how to behave, what to be concerned about, what is political correctness, all these things, right? And so this is one of the ones that I found, and I, I stole it, basically. And uh, because it, was, it wasn't taped down well enough, so I just grabbed it. And uh, so it says, sometimes a bad mood is more than just a bad mood. Mood and anxiety disorders are the most prevalent mental illnesses, affecting over 4 million people in Canada. Does that deserve our attention? Question mark. And then they have these little buttons which they hand out that say, not myself today. Okay? So they're making the individual conscious of their spontaneous behavior, of the tone of their voice, of what they might say, of, and so on, right? So they are, they are basically saying, look, if you can't handle this work environment and be equitable, and be, and be, you know, uh, politically correct, then you need to think about seeing your psychiatrist and getting onto some drugs <laughs> or something, right? Yeah, so basically, it's, the, there, it's an imposition of this, what you might call equity. And that, that's an example of that. So, um, okay, I guess I couldn't give this talk without mentioning the uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, one, one of his tweets on equity is, 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 he quotes someone saying the following, the equity movement is a highly virulent social pathogen, an autoimmune disease of the academy. So he's talking about the university, I guess, in, in, in the article that he's uh, quoting about. So 
yeah, that, that's, that's where we've gone with this. We've gone this kind of route, where it's so important in a certain layer of the society, whether it's in academia or at the government or so on, it's so important to be politically correct that you will um, allow the enforcers to just go after people who are not following these rules. And you will just go, you'll go crazy when these rules are broken. And the punishments will be disproportionate compared to the crime, right? That, that, that's where you're headed with this kind of thing. That's when it runs away. That's when it becomes pathological. Okay? So, you, you get this um, positive. Where does the positive, so how does it run away? Where does the positive feedback loop come from? Well, I think the problem is there's, there's gain in the system. And by that I mean there are too many rewards for being a victim. There's too many rewards for defending victims and victimhood. Right? You get a lot of self-worth from, from being a victim and you get a lot of self-worth from defending and standing up for victims, at least in what, by what you say and so on. So that puts some positive gain into the system that allows this, this process of equity for the good of, of the hierarchy to run away at certain times. That, that, that's how I would uh, explain it. Um, so you get extreme political correctness. You get um, hate speech criminal code provisions that are from the Middle Ages and that are being applied in Ontario as we speak. You get all these kinds of crazy things happening that are right up there with a theocracy having blasphemy censorship. Okay, that's, that's, that's where you go if you let political correctness run away like that. I can give you an example from my personal life, personal slash professional life, okay? I was fired from the University of Ottawa for being critical of the University of Ottawa. I was a full tenured professor, you know, <coughs> one of the most highly funded physics researchers and so on, and they decided they'd had enough. And the president of the university at the time was uh, a former federal minister, Alan Rock. Mm -hmm. And so my case was uh, supported by my union and went to arbitration. So we fought this out. And during the arbitration, of course, the university's tactic was to show that I was the devil in person that I said all these horrible things and that I was uh, inciting students to become I don't know what and so on. So it just went on for days and days where they, where they argued all of this and cross-examined me for weeks. And so at one point the, the lawyer showed a blog post of mine because I used to have this blog called U of O Watch. And on this blog post I had one of the many, many blog posts, I had talked about Alan Rock, and I had called him a douchebag, <laughs> okay? And so uh, the lawyer very aggressively said, you call the president a douchebag. How can you, how can you justify that? How can you, how can, how can you justify being a university professor if you're going to be calling the president of the university a douchebag? And I had a picture of what a douchebag was, like, like you know, the, 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 the medical instrument. And um, so my answer to that was, well, I was trying to give an example to students so that it would reduce the barrier for them if they wanted to be critical of the president of the university. So I wanted to make, put them at ease. I wanted to reduce that barrier. Okay, that, that's, that's why I did that. That's what I was trying to do. So I had an example, and that's what... And so that, that's an example of, I think, political correctness gone wrong. You should be able to say, when the president of the university does something really improper, to call him a douchebag, or to suggest that, you know, would it be, would it be right to call him a, a douchebag? And it should be okay for students to be critical of how the president is running the university, what the president is doing, where the president gets his funds, um, what he does to get those funds, and so on and so on. It should be, should be perfectly allowed, and it's a healthy thing in a dominance hierarchy to be able to make those corrections and so on. So that's my personal example. I had to throw that in there. 
Um, so one final point on this question of the uh, mechanisms in society is the following. We need to be against extreme political correctness. We need to be against extreme runaway equity. We need to be against using guilt to get people to be politically correct and so on. And the reason is that fighting is important. Fighting is the basis of establishing and maintaining the dominance hierarchy, which is our society. And so it's the, it's the elemental interaction of how our society is constructed. You can't artificially remove it in some layer of society. And this is starting to be recognized. For example, recently, just this month, in the New York Times was an article entitled, Kids, Would You Please Start Fighting? Okay? And so it explains how if you go, if you go zero tolerance crazy in the school against bullying and everything else, you're going to create an environment where, this, where the children are like neutralized to the point where they're not even fighting and arguing about things anymore. And so they're not developing as individuals. They're not challenging each other. They're not expressing the behaviors of others that disturb them. They're not vehemently and in a forceful way getting those points across. They're not doing any of that. They're becoming zombified. It's a horrible, it's a, it's a horrible thing to do to children and to members of our society. So this is uh, being recognized more and more now. And finally, this, I'm, I'm getting to the end now, I'm near the end, I want to talk about the laws uh, that uh, confirm and stabilize hierarchy and how these laws can be hacked or corrupted by individuals, by certain elite individuals. So basically, all of our civil rights and our fundamental human rights are just expressions of these laws. Uh, we have understood a, as, a, as, a, as, as a human species that we're going to have hierarchy, we want hierarchy, there's great benefits to it, but you need some basic rules because otherwise it will, you know, it'll fall apart, it'll, there'll be accidents, people will get hurt. And so you, 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 you make these universal principles. You have international law at the highest level. You go through some major world wars, you figure out that some things are just too nasty to ever occur again. You, you figure out that you know, torturing an individual is never acceptable. You figure, out, you figure out all these things through pain and through experiments and through trying out societal structures. And so you make up these universal principles and rules and you write them out. You say, we really should try and follow these rules. And then the individual nations, the nation states, uh, set up their constitutions. And they're expected to set up their constitutions in a way that is consistent with these universal principles that we agree upon internationally. Fine, and they set up their constitutions. And then th those constitutions are the highest level principles for the nation. And then all of the statutes, all of the laws that are written have to be consistent with that constitution. And then, so there are these important statutes, and then at a lower level you've got all these rules and bylaws and codes and codes of conduct in universities and so on. So you've got, the whole, you've got the whole gamut like that. And these laws are designed to give us fairness of treatment. Um, you know, the, the best way to get a rebellion is to egregiously mistreat a part of the population. They are going to be so upset, you're going to have a rebellion on your hands. That's a problem. So you need fairness. You need security. People can't just be getting killed any old time. You don't want to be running off to war just because someone said it was a good idea, and so on. You need some security. You need to prevent these egregious abuses of power that can really mess things up quickly. Uh, you know, a student gets shot on campus by the National Guards, you've got a problem on your hands. You know, the, it, it upsets a lot of people, a lot of students, and, and, and so on. 
Um, you need to maintain the hierarchical structure, the relationship to the state, um, the, 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 the sequence of corporations and, and so on. And you need to, and this is important, you need to allow and provide repair mechanisms for the hierarchy. And so the main, one of the main repair mechanisms that has to be there is freedom of expression and freedom to associate. And you know the Chinese recognize this. There, there's uh, someone quoted recently an, an old uh, saying uh, in China about how the way to make an oil lamp brighter is to adjust it. In other words, it meant that you, if you, you had to have discussions, you had to work it out, and then it was going to be whatever, find the solution. You know? So this is a very old idea that expression is a good idea. And so we have this notion of free speech. And I recently saw this picture on Facebook that's, that, that is a, kind of a graffiti that says free speech. And then there's an asterisk in the corner. And below the asterisk, it says conditions apply. <laughs> and it's signed, and it, it's yeah. signed uh, F U K T. <laughs> Fucked. Okay, so conditions apply. That that's the problem. It's true that free speech is an important uh, repair mechanism, but if you allow elements of the dominance hierarchy, or the dominance hierarchy itself, to decide when they can remove that free speech then how can it play this role of repairing the dominance hierarchy, you see? So there's a big problem with these conditions of plot. Uh, in Canada, we have a charter, and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the very first paragraph in it is Section 1. Do you know what Section 1 says? It, I'm going to paraphrase, but it basically says, any of these rights and freedoms can be disregarded by the government whenever the government feels that it's justified to disregard them. <laughs> That's section one of our chart. <laughs> That's right. They're, 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 it's using different words, but that's what in practice it means, okay? So you have to know that in the US, in the United States, the Constitution does not have such a clause. There is no such section one clause, okay? In the U.S., the rights are rights, and so many of the judges have interpreted them as such and have applied these rights rigorously. Now, there is a modern tendency, even in the U.S., to start applying these conditions, and to say, well, in a, in, a, in a free and democratic society, it can be reasonable when you're infringing on the rights of others, blah, blah, blah. They use this very sophisticated uh, language to say, in this case, we're just not going to give you that right, <laughs> okay? So I've, I've actually written about this problem. Uh, the, some of my articles on Dissident Voice directly address this problem and, and, and the nonsensicalness of those legal arguments that would allow this Section 1 and its use. So I've, I've thought about this a lot, and I think that's a big problem. So I won't, I won't uh, pain you through this uh, problem about Section 1 any more than that for today. I just want to quote Michelle Obama on this question of free speech. She recently said in a YouTube, when you have a voice, you know you just can't use it any kind of way. Uh, you know, you don't just say what's on your mind. You don't tweet every thought. I think she was thinking of someone in particular. Um, <laughs> most of your first initial thoughts are not yet worthy of the light of day, and so on and so on. So Michelle Obama is basically arguing that we need political correctness. You need to self-censor big time. You can't just let people know what you're actually thinking, especially if you're the President of the United States. <laughs> it's basically what she's saying. Okay, so, that, I think, is moving in the wrong direction. That's, that's, that's not where we want to go. Um, the other thing that happens in relation to these laws, I'm down to my very last points now, is that these laws themselves get corrupted and get um, hijacked. So we've got this charter and that's fine. We've got these wonderful laws that are consistent with the Charter. But you end up in front of the court, and what you find is that the judge 
is completely status biased. The judge is, is thinking, all right, who's the boss here? Okay? Who's, who's in front of me? There's this, there's this stench of status consideration yes. that is yes. really hard to take. You can, and, and if you're sensitive to it, you can see it immediately. You can see the rulings. You can, so if you've come to that point where the judges are not standing for the Constitution, and they're not even aware, they have to have lawyers explain to them what the law is and what the Constitution <laughs> is and how to interpret it and what the case law is and how to interpret it and so on, in every detail, instead of actually standing on the principle of why it's there and what it means and why it's essential and, and making rulings that are not just repeating what the lawyers have argued but that go straight to the heart of the matter, if you don't have that, then you might as well just say, We'll do what we want with you, and you don't have these protections anymore. That, that's, what, that, that's what I think is happening. So there, th this is why there are, there's backlash against this. This is why you hear things like, I think, you know, even Trump saying we've got to get judges back in there that actually hold up the Constitution. So I'm sure there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, but there is that as well. I think there is a real sentiment down deep that there are things that have gone wrong. I think that's a decay of a, of a dominance hierarchy. And I want to end by saying that these, in, in relation to freedom of expression, these are very real problems. Just, in the, just today, or was it yesterday or today, the Ottawa Public Library canceled a public showing of a film because some powerful people complain that you shouldn't, this film shouldn't be allowed to be shown. So I mean, it might as well be burning books, okay? That, that happened just recently. Um, there are, at the moment, hate speech criminal code uh, provision prosecutions ongoing in Ontario against individuals. And these provisions, you can put someone in jail for, what is it, some four years or so, where, where you don't have, where the state does not have to prove that a single actual identified person was harmed, okay? You just have to argue that what was said has the potential to create anger <laughs> against a, a group of people out there at large. You don't have to identify a single member of that group that was actually harmed or anything. This is how, this, this is the nature of these hate speech provisions in the criminal code. And there, be, there are prosecutions that are going ahead with this. And they're completely political. The, the attorney general has to okay each prosecution individually. So he can say no and it's not politically uh, uh, useful to prosecute because you know there's going to be uh, media attached to it. And he can say yes when he feels that it might be politically useful to have this prosecution go ahead, all right? So they're, they're political by nature, by design almost. And, um, e and also something that's going on right now in Toronto is uh, Toronto City Council is considering barring public demonstrations on all of its facilities, on all of its lands, on the basis of perceived hate. Okay, so if you decide that this group, you want to call them a special name and say that they're all about generating hate, you can bar them before you even know what they're going to say, preemptively. Prevent them from coming onto the land and having a demonstration in this democratic country. So that's where we're at. And that's why we need principled dominance hierarchy repair associations, such as, and I think Oakland is the first time you've ever been called that, but the Ontario Civil Liberties Association is such a repair mechanism. And we need associations like that. So I would encourage you to join the free email sign-up for that association to get their, their updates on what they're doing, to learn about these questions and this association, and to get involved if you want to. And that is the formal part of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.
today. So now the, this next this next part of the of the event is free discussion. So um, you know, like like really, just just feel free, and I will be the moderator. I'm used to doing this kind of thing. I did it for many many years, and so you just just say what you want to say. Yeah, we can start with you. Yeah, I think um, great great uh, talk. Thanks. First, but. Um, <coughs> Talk loud for this yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, very interesting talk. One of the things that struck me that you didn't really talk about too much is these societies that are dominant hierarchy societies are all paternalistic societies. There are examples of societies that are run more by women, right? You know, whether they be really primitive societies or more advanced societies, and the structure is very, very different. Like they're not they're not dominant hierarchical society. Or are they? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, so, I don't know about that. I haven't studied it. I haven't looked at the archaeological evidence. I, I don't know what that's about. In terms of large dominant hierarchies, or in terms of large societies, that yeah. they would be organized in some other structure well, I, I because they are because the leaders, I guess, are women rather than men. Yeah. Um, I just don't know about that. I mean, I'm open to learning about it. Uh, if you want to send me a journal article about it or whatever, I'd be happy to look at it, but I don't know anything about it. Yeah. I mean, I've heard of it. I've heard it being said, but I haven't uh, encountered it in my studies. Yeah? When we are brought up, we are not taught the benefit of being responsible of responsibility, taking responsibility. And so we grow up actually just taking responsibility at best for ourselves. But we don't grow up with the consciousness of taking responsibility. Civic duty, you mean? You're well, referring to I, civic I, duty? I, you can call it civic duty, you can call it duty as a citizen in a country. Yeah? So when, when you had approached your students and you gave them all, I believe, 100% mark and let them go, if you a student of a um, let's say, a medical, to become a medical doctor. I would really like to know whether the subject, whether I, I, I know the subject as well as I should, and that's the, the reason but the, for the Okay, test. but your, your question is a criticism of what you think I did in a course. No, 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 no. But, no, well, but um, when you said is there a question related to dominance hierarchy, or? Well, the question, the question of, Related to a dominant hierarchy is yeah. because we are not brought up with this consciousness of taking responsibility for our actions and for other people in our society. See, I don't know that that's true. I mean, I think we, I, unfortunately, I think we drive these kinds of uh, guilt and responsibility messages into children and students a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of that going on. I think what's more important is that there be um, good rules in place about uh, what you, you should not allow the government to interfere with things that it should not interfere with. I think that's like that should be like a ground rule. Okay, so we need to identify where, where are the things that. The society doesn't need the government to do this, doesn't need the government to micromanage this part of community or this part of the individual. Let's, let's carve that out. Let's, let's get the government out of that. that that's, that's the kind of um, fixing that I would like to see happening, okay? And have strict rules about that. That's what the Constitution was intended to provide. Because it, you know, when you say you have freedom of expression, it means the government should not um, suppress your expression. Okay, so it's clear cut. It, let's make it clear cut. Uh, I think we can work it out. We don't need the government to say, oh, but in this case, it could damage society if, if that person is allowed to express this. Uh, let's work it out. You know, get the government out and we'll work it out. Uh, that, that would be my one suggestion on how to make society better. That's what I think. I think there's too much interference and too much education in the sense of prescribing behavior and prescribing principles and so on. I think that if the individual can, can develop as a thinking person, can 
have the freedom to have the fights that they need to have, work things out, uh, and not be put in jail for it, and so on, I think things will be a lot better. That's what I think. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree with this, the old school view of things. Yeah? Uh, regarding uh, dominance uh, hierarchies, have you factored in what uh, like a higher being belief in religion or some other supreme being has? Like, how does that affect these uh, hierarchies? Like, do they make them more stable or less stable? Because yeah. you talk about inalienable rights in the American Constitution, those are given to, to the American people by God or a supreme being or a higher power. Right. And to some extent, those will survive for an extended amount of time. I'm not sure compared to other societies, other hierarchies. But does that have to factor in extending the lifespan of said hierarchy? I, I can only give you my opinion about this, right? But um, my sense is that religious belief is very useful in helping the individual to come to terms with uh, the rules that are being put in place that provide a very stable structure, very stable society. Okay. I think that the American Constitution has survived for a long time because it's a darn good set of rules. I don't think it's because um, it was originally motivated or justified to the, to the citizen as being God-given. I don't think that that is, a, it might have been facilitating originally to do it that way, but I don't think that that's the reason that, um, that uh, they've lasted this long and that they've been copied in many places. And, you know, it, it's not like America invented these elements of its constitution, of course, right? They're, they're much older than that. But there are these, these basic principles, like, you know, when you say thou shalt not kill, it, 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 it has an implication that the government shouldn't kill you either, right? <laughs> and so it's, it's a very good rule. Uh, it's a very good rule. It, it, it establishes some basic sense of security in the society and so on. It, it's, it's a rule that you can use to build a stable hierarchy where you're not going to have mobs of people going around killing who they don't like and so on, right? Um, I don't, I don't know if I really addressed your question. I, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud in, in response to. I was what just wondering if there was any studies specifically <coughs> whether that was a factor, whether like mm. it was a contributing factor to why it would last longer or be shorter. Well, religion is certainly a, a dominant institution in in uh, civilizations, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's it's. I, I, you know, the, the individual has to have a self-image about themselves and their place in society. And it has been extremely useful to think in terms of a belief in order to, in, in order to achieve that, you know. Um, and I think that even atheists have that kind of deep belief, not of God, but of some underlying reason or structure or justice, same things that are right and wrong and so on. So I think that there's an underlying thing, since we're conscious, I think there's an underlying tendency to have this kind of uh, deep sentiment that it should be fair. You should be able to avoid being killed in the next instant. You know, you should be, you know, and so on. So I think it's, it's seated in that. that. That's how I would, I would understand it. But in the organized religions have, I think, exploited this. And I think have uh, created a dominance hierarchical structure by exploiting the, this. Uh, and that, there's certainly plenty of evidence of that, right? So that's the problem. That's how I see it. And I'm... I'm so I'm gonna go next. I, I know that I, I'm, I'm keeping you in mind, but I'll go to John next. Yeah. Since you're you're being patient, right? Okay. When you when you said that um, the type of society that was uh, uh, envisioned by Marx in the in the Communist Manifesto, you said that this couldn't possibly work. Right. But it um, seems to me that something very much like that does work in say Cuba, that people you know act cooperatively and you know with the General, general societal good in mind rather than just for their, yes. their own their own <coughs> benefits. So, um, so of course, 
in terms of dominance hierarchy, the you know, imperialist countries are trying to crush that. Yes. But, but within, within, within Cuban society, it seems to work very well. And Venezuela is moving in that sort of direction also. So yeah. <coughs> I think it can work. No, I think, think that there are. I, 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 they would be either. It's, it's not the same I, thing. It's I think part. that there are elements of organization that can be applied in different circumstances that are useful and give rise to a stable structure. I don't have a problem with that, you know. But would it have been stable if you had removed Castro and his? structure of, well, of uh, government, you know, would, would it then have been stable on its own? I don't know. Would, would they have, would Cuba have been invaded? Probably, would, you know, and so on. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting, like I said, I think that these theorists were all great theorists and they all brought really clever elements to, uh, ideas about organizing society and about balancing the, 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 the oppression of the individual and the, the needs to have this structure to organize production and so on. They all had really good ideas about this and they put a lot of thought into it. Um, the mistake that I think Marx made was to say that it was inevitable that, you know, it's almost genetically inevitable that yeah. we were going to have socialism and um, it was a natural way to, to, to have people govern themselves, I think that's just plain probably wrong, you know, like, <laughs> so there were, there were errors, but there's also some really good ideas in there too. I mean, modern corporations try to get the opinions of their workers, some of them, you know, especially in the high tech, they, the, the, the ones that need the individuals to have these kinds of creative and liberty needs met, they find ways to achieve it, right? So there are many, many ways to organize this out. What I was trying to convey is that you have this hierarchy of, dom of, of dominance hierarchy and you find ways, there are spontaneous ways, all kinds of ways to make it work. There's some basic structures that you can see, that things are gonna break off, all kinds of stuff's gonna happen. And my point is, it's going to be in constant flux because there's always going to be elite groups that are going to try to change the rules to their advantage. There's always going to be abuses. There's always going to be bad decisions that over punish certain groups. There's always going to be uh, grievances that don't get uh, uh, answered. There's always going to be all kinds of things happening. So you have to find a system that is able to correct itself. Uh, without having an all-out burn down, you know? That, that's, that's what I was trying to communicate. That the, the basic rule is that you're gonna have, you've got this all, the, everything's in place in our, in our bodies and in our psyches to have dominance hierarchy. And so it's gonna happen. And so you have to think about how to guide it so that it doesn't burn itself, basically. That's what I think. That's what I think. Now, I'm gonna, Move over here and then back then. Is that okay? Go. Uh, so, do you mean to suggest that dominance hierarchies are inevitable in all contexts? Because it seems like a bit of a simplification. Of oh no, no, I don't. I don't. No, no, no. I, I don't mean that at all. Uh, there, there are limited spatial contexts where it, it, that wouldn't be the right model at all, right? You can have all kinds of agreements between little groups of people. You can have all kinds of arrangements locally that will work for a while that will be based on equity, that will be based on uh, equal sharing time, you know, <coughs> you can, if you, but what I tend to think of, what I think, what, what I tend to observe is that the situations where that occurs tend to be carved out of the larger dominance hierarchy. They, you tend to, you tend to, uh, you know, you go and you create a commune and we're going to do that. Or you rent a room in a community center and we're going to behave this way in this room for now, you know. And, and, then, and, then, and then sometimes it, be, it works for a while in that room and then someone gets insulted and then there's a yelling match as they walk out of the room. <laughs> but, you know, all kinds of things happen. But what I find is that the, the, those equity circumstances can be created 
for people who want to create them and who consciously that's what they want for a certain limited time, but in a carved out situation. That's been my observation. That's, so now, uh, you, you've been really patient, my friend. Okay. W what did you want to get to? Um, today I was like... Uh, the reason I didn't go to you straight away is because sometimes you have a habit of asking three long questions <laughs> all together. I've got one big long question. <laughs> go I'll for try, it. Yeah. Um, well, this year we're celebrating like 500 years of the uh, Reformation. Like in 1517, Luther nailed 95 theses to Wittenberg door. And like about uh, dominance hierarchy, like the Catholic Church ruled all of Europe, and then this guy, like, it became corrupt. And so this man, Luther, he's a monk, he rebels, he reacts, he writes 95 theses, he nails it to Wittenberg door, and he sparks the Reformation. And he's, so he's really lucky, because the leader of Germany at the time, Frederick, protects him, and then, like, you know how... Uh, breaks from Rome and stuff, and right. anyway, so I th I've heard this story before. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, but, it's familiar, but, 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 right? Where are you going with it? Um, I'm asking you, yeah, about dominance hierarchy. Like, how does this filter? Oh, like today, you see, the church now has co-opted Luther. They're agreeing with Luther now, and I was at today. I was at Notre Dame, and like they had Luthers and Catholics. I was at a service with Luther's and the Catholic together. Mm -hmm. And downstairs, the German embassy had this whole mock-up of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And the Catholics are like, yeah, like Luther was right all along. <laughs> and they, they had him damned. The Pope, he was damned in hell. The Pope, uh, a recent Pope, flipped them into heaven or into purgatory. Okay. So like, they you sort of see, hell. yeah, <laughs> pulled them out of hell. So I wanted to ask you about dominance. Well, I don't know anything about hell. Yeah. I mean, your whole talk. <laughs> you, you could well, do a whole talk on the Reformation and I mean, stuff. The, the, I mean, how does this jive? Mm. Do you see a connection? There? No. Well, yeah. I mean, religion yeah. is part of it. Here was this like all these. I think. I think. What I'm trying to say is that if you if you are studying history and you're looking at these big movements. Uh, if you put on dominance hierarchy glasses, it will give you a clearer analysis and a clearer vision of what's going on. That's what I'm saying. So in other words, if you, if you don't do a Marxist analysis, or you don't do a this analysis or that analysis, but you say, okay, anything can happen here. This, this is the general thrust of where, you know, this, this is how things are driven. This is what's going to happen. It's going to spontaneously find all these ways to create this. There's going to be internal degradation of it. There's going to, if you if you try to take that kind of an outlook, you'll probably be able to piece some things together and see examples of it and make sense of it more realistically, I think, than if you do, you know, if you if you wear one of these classical hats, of, uh, social theorists. That's that's what I would say. Cool. That's. <laughs> yep. I have what I love. Um, Hi. Number one, I admire the speaker because he was hired maybe 10 years ago from the University of Ottawa. And today, he's back to the University of Ottawa <laughs> and giving a speech <laughs> about freedom of speech, and it, which, which was the reason maybe for I think, to uh, get fired 10 years ago. Uh, my question is, and I don't know if you have an answer for that question, just I have it now. Just comparing the uh, something that you cannot compare, but sometimes you need to, the, the human, the blessed human, and the animals. Uh, do the animals have restriction when it comes to freedom of speech or speech? Do they have I don't think so. Like, I can prove it, but I don't think so because I've never seen animals like fighting over uh, uh, a sentence or whatever. So we need to, as a human, we need to upgrade. And, and, and come like uh, improve in order to get to the level of uh, animals. When I say animals, I'm not discrediting a uh, human. I'm religious. I have faith, and I understand that everything is created for the human being. So um, the other thing is uh, why I like uh, is the first time when I see him face to face. Because what happened to him is happening to me right now. So he was faced with defamation and uh, almost like they asked him for a uh, half million dollar because he said something that out of context. Uh, something that is related to the human uh, right code 
and the expertise, the human rights tribunal, the expertise is the human rights, they have that expertise. And cases worse than that, uh, the, the, the uh, respondent paid about $3,000, $4,000, 5000 let's say $10,000. I don't know how one, one sentence out of context cost half a million, uh, half a million for, for this thing. Uh, I would let uh, the other so you're, you're participants, and now we're facing uh, an action for two hundred thousand. So I'm lucky. So we pay three fifty, and I'm facing two hundred. I'm fighting this because also it was related to because I, I was fighting for the student of Montpellier. I was fighting for the freedom of expression. So uh, thanks everyone who came here, and I'm so happy to see many people coming tonight. Saturday, uh, because this is the start for the change. So now, what are the problems that I see in the future? Uh, it's great to have freedom of the speech, but the problem is, before we talk about freedom of the speech, speech, we have to um, have freedom for something else before we get there. Is number one, and I'm directly to the camera, is uh, we have to free our politicians, number one, and then free our judges. Because if politicians and judges are free, then we can go and speak about freedom of speech. Today we don't have that. Uh, a few months ago, a judge in front of me, he came and said, my hands are tied. And I have that in the record. I'm in Canada, I'm in Ontario, and the judge comes to me saying, my hands are tied. And at the end, he ordered cost to the people who are represented. So my question was, how come the judge who had his recognized that hands are tied, it's all going to cost. So uh, I think the next step is, before we get to the free home speech, we need to free our politicians because the minute they get elected. Well, we, we, don't, we don't have individually the power to free people higher than us in the hierarchy, right? <laughs> so it's a difficult task, but you're uh, going to go through hell through in this uh, lawsuit if you pursue defending yourself, uh, it's, it's a very arduous you know, you can't task, win. and the, the courts are definitely biased against the little person, there's no question about that, it's all about the status of your lawyers, so you're going to, exactly. you're going to have a hard time, and so I wish you luck, um, but I want to come back to your original question, which is the suggestion that animals uh, you asked, you know, whether or not animals are suppressed in their freedom of expression. And I want to disagree with you because uh, humans are animals. There is no doubt about that in my mind, you know. And there's far more similarity between social mammals and humans uh, than we like to think. And there's, there's no question, most, a lot of the uh, dominance hierarchy research is done on animals in the wild, okay? And so there's no doubt that, for example, uh, animals are suppressed in their expression. If you're an underling in one of these dominance hierarchies, uh, you're going to be very careful about your expression, whether it's bodily expression or growling or where, even where you, where you look, where you're looking, that's expression, right? You're going to be extremely careful about your behavior because uh, you're part of this uh, very stringent uh, hierarchy. And so animals suffer exactly the same kinds of, of pressures. And there are the same kinds of repair mechanisms in animal uh, dominance hierarchies, I think, as well. For example, you know, a a dominant, I don't know, lion who goes overboard in in dishing out punishment is going to make some young males quite angry, and eventually one day they'll grow strong, they'll gang together, and they'll take this guy out. And that will be, to some extent, will stabilize the hierarchy because it will prevent a particularly uh, uh, you know, genetic preferring only his offspring kind of guy from, from continuing his, his work, right? And so there's this balancing, there's this balancing act. All, all of these, I think all of these phenomena are occurring in animal societies. And so th this is not 
a fight that's unique to humans. This is, this is how social animals organize and survive and react to being dominated. And the, like I said earlier, the, 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 the underlings are not as healthy and they get sick more often and they die sooner. And uh, that's part of keeping them in their place. And this is a very real phenomenon. It's, it's the same in human societies. If you look at uh, uh, mortality rates, uh, it correlates very, very strongly to your position in the hierarchy. Very strongly. There's no, no doubt about it. You don't have to talk about healthy eating or anything. You know, it's, that's, that's, the main, that's the main predictor of, animal, of human health. So it's, it's the same across the board, I think. I wouldn't make a distinction. We're already animals. You don't have to ask for us to be animals. Okay. Going back to what the animal one first. It's nice to get a question from the Civil Liberties Award winner of this year. Oh, hi. 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 several candidates, mm -hmm. and, and so on. So, of course, there are going to be mechanisms that will counter that. So what you're suggesting is, let's have a rule that will fix this problem that we presently have in the dominance hierarchy because we've had deterioration, and let's eliminate parties and have only independent candidates. And it's a good rule, it's a good idea, and you implement it, and then immediately there are forces that try to subvert it, right? Because you do have a dominance hierarchy and you will have these, these forces coming into play. So that's, that's well, the... Well, that doesn't exist right now. Oh, exactly. Right now. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and the other point, on the other point that you made, um, is um, this question about your cat and your dog. That's another thing that is not different between humans and animals. That is, you know, we have pets, we have interspecies relationships. Well, so do animals. Monkey tribes adopt, steal and adopt, uh, you know, cubs of wild dogs. And they have them as part of their, of their uh, societies. And they serve a purpose, and they're underlings, and uh, this happens all the time. So even, even that, I even interspecies relations, is not something that's unique to humans in terms of cats and advanced <laughs> animals. Even, even that is, is something that we share with animals. So, uh, we have to be careful when we start to say that humans and animals are different. You know, let, okay, let's find the differences. It's a challenge, you know? So that's, so that's another thing I wanted to say. But, yeah, was I, what, did I unfairly respond to your <laughs> suggestion about the independent candidates? Oh, you mean like that dog? Did I not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so uh, you're, you're new and also Michael. Michael, do you want to come? Sure. Um, it's, it's actually a little bit about, about the activism course and, uh, and some academic which I'm involved in right now. Um, I, uh, when I was younger, um, there were issues to do with human trafficking and like crime that were happening in my neighborhood. And I had mental health issues and like difficulty even believing 
whether things were real or not. And that sort of continued up until the point where I was, I actually got involved with the activism course, and then I, was, I felt like I was in a space where I was more empowered to talk about issues and to, to be heard, and that, you know, there was some value to, to my, what I, my, what I had to say and what I believed, and it helped me believe myself more, and, you know, ha having a space to take myself more seriously, and I feel like, I feel like, that actually, and, I, and you know, I think that's an ongoing thing where that, that you know things can go up or down. But but just that that having that space to like actually just dis discuss issues and try and under just even just the first step of just understanding them, not even just trying to solve things or change things, but just understanding the problem. Like right. So well, okay, but you're just to explain to others, you're talking about the so-called activism course, which is a, a course that I ran at the University of Ottawa which is a course in which we uh, carved out this space, we were talking about that in an earlier question, where in which um, there was less hierarchical structure within that class, right? So people had more of a say on how it was going to be organized, the professor took more of a back seat and didn't impose anything and even agreed to step out of the room while the students discussed how to organize certain aspects of the course and so on, right? So it was, a, it was intended to be a more uh, uh, a space where you didn't have the imposition of the institution, where the students could really decide what motivated them, how they were going to organize things, what they were going to spend time on, and so on. It was an experiment in that sense. And you're referring to that. And you're suggesting that for you, it had some benefits. Yeah. Um, and I got that a lot. A lot of students were very, very uh, enamored with that course. And a lot, a lot of students actually wrote to me and told me that it was life-changing for them. That, uh, you know, they were going to give up and do something else, but they didn't, they stayed, and they're glad they did, and so on and so on, right? So, but you're referring to, like, that's ancient history. You know, that was way back, way back, <laughs> beginning of 2000s, yeah. Okay, but did you have a specific point about this? Uh, it was on, uh, just basically the main topic of the talk tonight, freedom of expression. Yeah. Just that, that can be empowering, and the, from my own personal experience, that it does... It, does, it seems to be a space, like, like just, just in terms of relationships, some people will say, and this is like Gottman Institute, so about marriage and, and so on, that basically as long as communication is happening, then, then a relationship can keep evolving and issues can be re repaired. But as soon as the communication isn't happening, then people yeah. can't understand what's going on and they can't fix it. Yeah, that's at an interpersonal level. That's right. Yeah, and in, I, that, I, in that course, what happened was the students, the, the dean, said that the students couldn't have the course anymore. He tried to stop the course, he tried to end it at the beginning of the semester. And the students, since they had developed by then uh, relationships and expression skills and so on, they decided to, no, that wasn't going to happen. So there was a big fight between the students and the dean. And the next week, the dean came into the class and, and apologized and said, OK, you can have the course however you want it, and so on. <laughs> and it was in the media and everything. It was quite an exciting time. The, the students. I remember the students challenging the dean when he came into the class to tell them they was going to close it. And they, they, you know, they'd stand up one after the other and directly challenge the dean. It was very impressive to see. And uh, I remember him backing towards the door like this, you know, as more and more students were standing up in this large class. Um, and then come back the next week to say that, well, okay, yeah, no, um, we've come to an agreement with Professor Rancourt and you'll be able to have the course. Uh, like you said you would. <laughs> and so it was quite, that was an exciting time. Except I suffered some serious consequences as a result of it. <laughs> but that's another story. I know, I know things um, that happen on one level, like interpersonal, don't always reflect on like micro, lower scales or greater scales. But like in general systems theory and other things, sometimes, sometimes certain pr principles do carry on even if the mechanisms aren't always exactly the same. So that's part of why I want to bring up personal experiences. Right. Right. To something I get it. Yeah. Good. Matt. Yeah, Mr. Rancourt, beautiful uh, thought process and explanation of a natural human organization behavior. Like, I would definitely go, I'll make a couple, two points really, only two. Go for it. Um, and maybe you could talk about what you think of this. Um, in a sense, institutional thought and in academia should be, in theory, put together to elicit these ideas and put things up into the cloud and allow society the opportunity to solve these problems 
and freedom of expression, and that dialogue is central to doing that. But it's also dangerous to the organization and stratification of our class society and structure and dominance hierarchy. In allowing that free flow, it's very hard to control and organize resources under a capitalist model. And so in theory and in practice, there's mechanisms and institutional ways that are done in order to make maintain a Absolutely. The, the university balance. the university is a time bomb. So it's a very sorry, Matt. I, I'm going to interrupt you in the middle of it. That's okay? great. That's but the I'm going to pick up. Yeah. I'm going to pick up what you just said. The university is a time bomb. It 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 has potential to be a very dangerous place because you put all these people together who have time to think and exchange. You put them in 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 proximity to each other. You give them resources, and my God, anything could happen. Right? It's amazing. So uh, it's a very dangerous place. And therefore, if you're serious about maintaining a dominance hierarchy and not having your own status and position disturbed or threatened, you need to make sure that nothing happens. Okay? <laughs> so you need to get all the professors on board. You need to really constrain that process. You need to make sure there's a lot of homework, a lot of crazy demands that don't make any sense, things that they will have to do for grades that will not be of any use to them in, in their lives, uh, not give them time to think about what they're doing, not give them time to analyze, to do the research, to work at their own pace so that they're actually understanding it. You don't want any of that because it could lead to important discussions between students. It could lead to all kinds of things, right? Uh, so the university is very carefully structured so that the professor is standing here and you see there's a big screen there and that's where the professor projects from that projector the, his, his or her PowerPoint slides. And these PowerPoint slides are spoon feeding words and images to the students that they will have to memorize in order to regurgitate them at a test and at the final exam. And um, nothing else pretty much, I'm generalizing, but as a general rule, nothing else is, is allowed, and the professors themselves are kept so busy that they wouldn't have time to start engaging and, and having discussions in their office, lengthy discussions that follow from discussions that happen in the class. There's no time for any of that, and there's no time for, there's no energy left to actually think, for the professor to actually think about what they're saying while they're saying it. And so none of this can happen, and the perfect solution is these crazy PowerPoint presentations of this sterile material. All the students are like dying from being exposed to these things, Look, doing their email and looking at things on their laptop. Thank God for those laptops <laughs> and their cell phones because otherwise they, they would die from it. Um, but that's, that's what the universities have become. And it, 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 it's, it's almost, it's a criminal waste of human talent and resources. And, uh, but the, the alternative would be uh, this dangerous situation. I mean, we, we've seen We've seen what happens when there are sit-ins and there's occupations and there's students thinking for themselves and, and deciding to play a role in the government of universities. I mean, nowadays, the students, you start, them, you start young, the, more and more, even the primary schools, high schools have become like prisons and they follow this model and they have these touch-sensitive screens the professor plays with and so on. And so they really, and, and of course it's equitable and there's no bullying and there's all this stuff, so <laughs> they're zombies. And um, so there's, there's no danger. You, once they get to the university, they, they can't think anymore. They, there's, no, there's no more danger. You've already handled the situation. So they, you, can, you can allow them to have representatives on the Senate of the university. You can allow them to be on important committees and so on, because they're not going to do anything. They're, they're, they, don't, they wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't know what to think about it. They don't even know to realize to go and read the, the bylaws and so on and figure out that they actually have power, because those powers were won for them by their colleague students of the 1960s who fought to have this representation on all these committees and all this Senate. And they won that, and now they're not using it. They're just zombified. They're like, okay. And they want, so, so, and the ones that apply, of course, for these positions are the ones that just want a position within that hierarchy. They want, they want to occupy those positions. So they're perfectly happy to serve uh, whatever, whatever that committee, however that committee is serving the other professors and, and, and executives on those committees and so on, in terms of their status and their position and running the place. So, I mean, that, 
is the modern university. Um, yeah. It's very frightening. And if you try to have, I mean, I could go on for a long time about this because I did a lot of experiments. I tried a lot of things and discovered a lot of things. And one of the most shocking discoveries was that the students have become zombified. You, you, you can't even get them interested in having a discussion or thinking about things anymore. I mean, at the start of my career, they were alive still. And they were coming, a lot of them were coming from the CIGEP, and they were, they were, they were, they were uh, fighting with the professors. They were spunky, they were, uh, they were argumentative, they were all kinds of things. And I could, I, I could see over a two decade period them just becoming these zombies where they would come into class and, and listen to me patiently, not interrupt, not demand anything, and at the end of the class come and see me and say, could you suggest extra homework for me to do? And I'm like, oh are you kidding me? You want more homework? Like I've given you all this stuff to think about. It's like really complex material. I've already suggested things you can do. We're trying to have a discussion class, and you just want me to assign extra repetitive, silly, stupid <laughs> exercises from a textbook? Are you kidding? I didn't respond that way. And that's why I'm thinking in my head. I was like, are you kidding me? This is what we've come to. So I witnessed this this total degradation that in Ontario had to do with Mike Harris taking out grade 13 and uh, also taking out the high school teachers' time for preparation and professional development. And you know, all that mattered was time in the classroom. Well, then you're a prison guard. You know, you're not a professional thinking person interacting with students. You're a freaking prison guard. And so this was Mike Harris's brilliant idea. And so that and many other things led us to where we're at now, uh, which is a really frightening place. Yeah. But I, so I, I, I'm sure how did we get into this? How did you guys draw me into this? <laughs> well, I mean, I'd like to say something. Yes, please. I'm please. a senior, and it's not just the young people and the students. This is the Canadian society. You try talking about anything, because I'm involved in controversial things in my life fighting for rights in my own way. And if you try talking about any, these are really serious issues. Um, nobody, nobody wants to talk about anything. It, you're, it, it's not socially acceptable. It's not just not to talk about uh, racial things and, and that aren't acceptable. Anything serious or, or um, and not nice uh, and, and pleasant isn't acceptable. And that's not just the young people. It's this, Canadians have got to start standing up for themselves because we're losing. If you don't use your rights, you lose them. I saw that on a bumper sticker. <laughs> and it's, it's like, I'm, I'm just really like, I'm, I'm really sort of glad I don't have too many more years to be on earth because it's, it, to me it's really intolerable where, where we have laws, like you think you have rights to privacy or, or whatever, access to information or whatever those laws. But they have the conditions that apply. <laughs> and when you go to exercise them, you find out if you don't really have them. So yeah. it, it's really. Yeah, uh, access to information is a joke. The Canadians are nice. Yeah. But they better be careful about being <laughs> too nice. Like, if, if you speak out, then you're not a nice person. This is what I'm sort of saying. Mm -hmm. Like, if you try even with doctors. To, to advocate for your rights in the medical, with the medical profession, I've had them. They say my uh, uh, behavior is inappropriate, <laughs> but they don't say what. It's just because you, you don't agree with them or whatever. So it's really, it's really um, hard to be uh, an advocate today. Too. It's hard to be difficult. It's very lonely. It's very very lonely. <laughs> Yeah. This guy I see a new, a new person asking. What do you think is the real force behind this? Um, is it a North American stupefaction process? Could it be like sourced from another place for a reason? Because North Americans have a bit of a distinct uh, type of people, the, the strong adventuresome risk takers who came here. Now, I want to also comment on you know what's happening to us. How are we getting so stupid? Um, and I don't think it's the fluoride in the water. 
I don't think, I'm going to anger a lot of people here, I know, but I don't think that it's, uh, uh, you know, aerosols and chemtrails and all of these things that concern people in relation to their health and so on, that I don't think that's, that's what's making us stupid. What I, what I believe is the process of the hijacking of society's rules by the elite and what those rules end up being is making us dumber and dumber because it takes away our occasions to develop, to push back, to have a say, to um, do what you have to do in order to develop and, and uh, as, a, as a person. Uh, it, there's so much control and more and more of it and it's always growing and piling on. It's like these institutions have lives of their own and they complexify their rules and they perfect their rules and if something is a little bit out of line even though it only happens once in a million years, they'll make a new rule to make sure that never happens again and there'll be a new procedure put in place and there'll be this and there'll be that. And so <coughs> you have all of this happening in the schools, in the hospitals, in the government service agencies, everywhere you are not letting people just interact, whether it's the service counter person and the person asking for something and so on. You're just, you're, you're, you're codifying everything. And so it ends up, I think, making us really stupid. If you codify everything in school, if you say the steps to learning how to read are the following, you know, 39 steps spread out through these first grades of, and what these are what you're going to read and so on. I mean, this is nonsense. Learn to first. And, yeah, okay, you have to learn how to count first, right? Because it, there's all these steps. But um, if you do it that way, um, you're going to risk that a lot of people will not discover what it's like to actually figure out how to read on your own, you know? And you're, th that whole element of what it is like to read and the freedom of learning is going to be removed from the equation, and you're just going to become, you're just going to be repeating these steps. And, and so you'll eventually pick up things like that, but so I think that all of this codification and finding the formula to make perfect, compliant, participating citizens, and always increasing that, is what's making us this stupid. Think about what you just said. Yes, we're compliant in Sorry. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, coding. Yeah. Computer program. A computer has to have everything, and that's what maybe the source of the problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I, I think that's what makes us stupid. So I, I've seen it, I, I saw it at the university when I, I was there for, you know, I've been in the educational system for three decades more, and um, I, I saw it come into play. I saw it even, even in research I saw it, not just at the student level, but researchers, you know. It's, when it started, when I was applying for a research grant at first, they would say, it's a research operating grant, you just tell us what you want to do, and then we give you money, and then well, really, just do what you want after that, you know. And then, uh, three years down the road, tell us what you did, and then apply for more money. Say what you're going to do, but you don't have to do it. You just have to show us that you can think of something to do. And so that, that was, and it was understood that these, this research funding could not be targeted towards some corporate or government desire. That the researcher had academic independence to decide what was important and how they were going to have influence and you could do it. And so that was at the beginning of my career and by the middle of it you already had that funding was gone, it was replaced by strategic uh, goals and you had to discuss with corporations, find out what they wanted, to do something that they might like and da 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 and so on. And so in the end, it, by the end of it when you applied for grants you had to say exactly what you were going to do. You couldn't deviate from it, you had to give the steps, you had to give the milestones, you had to explain in detail how you were going to achieve that, who you were going to hire to do it, at like five years ahead of time, and, and so it's not research anymore. It's not, if you have to know what you're going to get, and how you're going to do it, and so on, it's not research. Like, you can't do that. If, if you can't, if you don't have the freedom, you know, in, in the first year to discover that was a stupid idea, and um, I really should be doing something else. If you don't have the freedom to do that because you're going to risk your career, then it's over. 
it's over. Well, that's how it evolved, just during the time that I was there. So, this is what I say. I think it's, it's the, 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 the system has a natural tendency to make itself uh, into a machine that produces retards. So the computers are made as retards. Another way to put it, maybe. I don't think it's the technology itself, but it's, it's the, the, the organization. Concentration. Yeah. So you, you, wait, this, this, this fellow has a question. You, 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 have, you, have, you, have you asked a question? Oh, no, really, sorry. Okay, so him and then you? I just have a comment. Okay, a comment. The Go. stupefaction of society is part of the dominant hierarchy. Yes. That's all I want to say. I it's see. the elites dumbing everybody down so they yeah. can have more and more freedom yeah. to do more and more corrupt right. acts. Right. Yeah. That's basically, yeah, That's. I think we're on the same wavelength. That's what I was, uh, sort of yeah, what I was saying. saying it, but just to sum it up, stupefaction yeah. is part of the dominant hierarchy by the elites. It's part of the, it's part of the, the process talk. of building that, that. No, no, it's a part of the people it's part of, trying to gain more favor. Yes. More yes. favor position yes. in the hierarchy. Yes. By the way, until they go too far and then people will rebel. Right? I talk a lot about that stuff in my book. Okay. What is <laughs> it's it called, called Hierarchy and Free Expression in the Fight Against Racism. Okay? Hierarchy so, and Free Expression in the Fight Against Racism. Free Expression in the Fight Against Racism. So, um, so and where, where racism. I explain is used to exploit, and it's used to. You, anyway, it's in the book. Yes, we, we all, we all so, know. You don't need to. Okay, explain. so so, yeah, go for it. Right. Is it fair to say that free speech can be used by dominance hierarchies to serve their own control purposes? So, for example, uh, in China, the communists in the mid '50s had the hundred flower campaign where they said, we're going to have free speech. If you have criticism of the government, post it on this wall. Of course, all those people were observed, and then down the road, <laughs> people who stood up and, and expressed themselves freely ended up, you know, being ending, ending unable to do it again. No, but that's, that's not actual free speech. That's just a, a trap. It's just a okay, device, right? Enough. That's not actual free speech. Sure. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But what about... Uh, Say free speech is attention release, where you're allowed to talk about things, just nothing ever happens. Yes. So yes, I, I have an illusion, right? Yeah, I mentioned that. I, I I alluded to that in my in my presentation, where I explained that freedom. There is this component about oh, you're allowed to believe it, you're allowed to think it. Um, sometimes you're allowed to express it, but you're never allowed to have influence through that expression. <laughs> that would threaten the hierarchy. Okay, so that's that's how it works. Like like in international law, if you look at the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it states in there quite explicitly, you have an absolute right uh, of what you want to believe or think. They they can't. Someone can't torture you to find out what you really believe or what you really think, if they think it's a bad thing, and then punish you for. You have an absolute right of your beliefs. Okay, so you go from an absolute right to what you believe. Now let's talk about expression. You have a right to express what you believe. <laughs> but there are limits, okay? So now you're into the limits of that. And then, if you're actually trying to have an influence, well, it becomes subversion, terrorism, it becomes all kinds of things, right? If you're actually going from just expressing to actually politically organizing and wanting to have an influence, mm. then you become someone that we want to watch. <laughs> and that it, you, there you have criminal charges. You have all kinds of things happening there. Okay, so that's right. I mean, if a, a right of expression, even an absolute right of expression where you're not allowed to organize and try to have influence, what does it mean? It means nothing. The whole idea of expressing is to try to have influence on in your community, uh, with the people that you're close to, and in the broader society. That's the whole idea of expression. Why else would you express? You know. Well, that's one of the main reasons. So that's and that's the most threatening one. So yeah, that, that's a good point because there's a lot of times where the courts and the government will say, "Hey, you can say that," because we know it. Nobody's listening. 
<laughs> or he, you can, because we know that you sound crazy and no one's going to listen to you. Or they'll and, uh, identify a problem, and then people have the idea that simply because it's being discussed, that in some sense there's going to be some kind of yes. reasonable resolution to yes. it. And then you know they'll have a royal commission. Oh yeah. And then ten years from now, and twenty-eight million dollars later. Nothing happens. Exactly. Mm. So for so it's now become part of the Canadian law. More and more, the Supreme Court is saying the government has an obligation to consult those people who are affected. Okay. So they and if you don't mm. consult them, that decision was not legitimate. So as long as you go through the steps of consulting them, then you can do whatever the heck you want. Then you can do whatever you want. Whatever you want. <laughs> so you have to consult <laughs> the, the Aboriginal people. You want to take their land. You better consult them, and it better be a thorough consultation, and you better follow all these rules. And this is what the Supreme Court has laid out for you to do. And so sometimes they'll overturn a government decision on the basis that the consulting mechanism was not thorough enough. Okay? Uh, yeah. So what? You consult. Yeah. Right. It's 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 so a lot of these committees that consult, there's no democracy. The, the people who are involved, the majority of the people, that you don't get to make the decision, right? It's just a boondog, really. A yeah. bunch of parasites get paid, yeah. and nothing ever happens. Well, Absolutely. 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 Okay, so, did, 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 have, you, have you gone already? You have? Does anybody, does anybody want to, you haven't. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the topic. Yeah. Um, so, Stephen <coughs> Pinker argues that we live in the like, most peaceful society in all of human history. Right. Mm. And yeah. I assume you agree with that, which I think is at least probable. Yeah. Um, why doesn't this mean that we uh, live in the most healthy, dominant society that has ever existed? I beg your pardon. I, I can't I, hear you. Yeah. What? I <laughs> hope I can hear what I hear. So, presuming it's true, presuming violence is at an all time low, yeah. so why does that not mean that we live in the most healthy, dominant hierarchy? Right, right. So I think we have to start by saying, what do we mean by health? By uh, violence. Okay. Uh, how do you how do you how do you gauge violence in a society? That's that's a big question because in a given society, certain <coughs> levels of physical aggression in a, in a, historically will not have a big impact on individuals. Let's say in the past because it would not have been an aggression that threatens their status or their self-image. It, it would not have put them at risk that in, in, through the mechanism that affects their health. Whereas that same level of physical aggression or speech aggression or whatever, if you bring it up closer to our time, is one that because of the psychology of the person within that system, they will uh, feel that their identity is more threatened. And that threatened identity is a tremendous source of stress. That stress has physiological effects, uh, depresses the immune system and so on. You get more sick, you're not as healthy. So you have to be careful because violence is not an absolute, just pure physical thing. It's how, if you want to talk about the effect of violence, you have to talk about the receptor. And the receptor is not a pure animal that you just that is defined outside of the community, the society, the, mm -hmm. it, their history, and so on, right? And so that would be part of the answer that I would give, right? It's a convolution between the individual and what's happening to them. Yeah, the convolution is a kind of a mathematical concept about how you have to put it together. But um, that's what I would answer about that. That's one answer. Um, the other thing is, if you mean, like, you, you might be able to say, like, there's violence and there's violence, right? <laughs> Do you mean that there's a chance that you'll be hit by a bomb and totally be destroyed? Um, or do you mean there's a chance that you'll get beat up? Or do you mean there's a chance that, you know, you'll get pushed? Or do you mean that you'll get pushed a hundred times? Is, the, is getting pushed around, like people pushing you out of the way when they want to go somewhere and so is that happening a hundred times, is that more or less violent than being thoroughly beat up once? Is being thoroughly beat up ten times 
like constantly being thoroughly beat up. You know, you just you, is that is that more violent than being killed? You know, these are these. If you try to quantify violence, oh you're, you're 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 entering into hearing, all these questions. I'm not hearing a physicist say mm -hmm. this because I've been long thinking that mm -hmm. that we transmuted a certain action into minuscule little bits. Yeah. But if you do the math, it's the same. Well, no, I'm not saying it's the same. Well, no, I'm not saying it. I'm, I'm, I'm posing the question. I'm posing the question, right? There, I mean, we're, we're now in a world of microaggressions, okay? Uh, and there's a lot of talk about microaggressions and so on. So, you know, it, it's a good question. You know, is, do microaggressions actually pile up and accumulate in the person? Or, or and, and it, does it work the same way for all persons? Or, if given that it's a microaggression, does it only have an effect for a very short time and immediately gets repaired and you brush it off and then you have another one, you brush that one off and they don't accumulate. You know, that's, it's, it's, it's almost like a physics mathematical problem, right? Yes. But it, it, th those are the questions yes. you have to ask. And it uh, depends on a lot of things. But um, I, wouldn't, I, I think that in the end, <coughs> And also, it gets complicated because you might be in a culture where you have an advantage to identify as someone who suffers from an excess of microaggressions. There might be an advantage that you identify that way. It might be, you know, so it gets really complicated really quickly, you know, how, how, how this all how works. How can you have a, be a victim so, of advantages? I meant to ask you about it. How can what? You, you mentioned the victim having advantages. Well, that would like be a good topic of discussion. Right. You know, is it? What are the advantages that come from from being a victim, or from identifying as a victim, or from expressing that you're a victim, or from um, <laughs> you know what? What are the advantages of that? I mean, I think it's a fair question, and mm -hmm. it would be a good a good topic yeah. for discussion. Um, it's a very dangerous topic because some people will accuse you of uh, diminishing the experience of victims and that accusation can be very vehement and so to even try to have the discussion is going to be a dangerous one it's, it's going to, you know, you're putting yourself at risk to even try to have that discussion and that's, that's the world that we live in now that's the world that we live in it, these are the difficulties it's it's really really tough. It's it's it, is that a quick follow up? It is a quick follow up. Okay. Is, I would just say sort of my way of looking at the answer to the question that I asked <laughs> is um, that Steven Pinker is talking about violence. He's not talking about coercion, right? If I go up to you and I I rob you, I threaten to do violence to you unless you do something and you comply. That doesn't count as violence uh, in this sort of sense where we're talking about number of deaths, etc. Mm -hmm. It actually does count as coercion uh, and, you know, affecting Dolan's hierarchy relationships and the stress, etc. Um, so that's sort of my, my answer. Yeah. There's an interesting animal study, or more than one, that shows that uh, among animals that fight all the time and that, that uh, impose the dominance hierarchy, uh, some of the dominance, they, there's a habit of inflicting random violence on the other individuals. And it's very important that it be random violence, totally unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're, you're dominant and you just spot someone, you go and you whap them for no reason at all. You know, or you bite them or you growl at them or whatever. And you do this constantly and it has to be random. And they do this, the, the studies suggest that they're doing this to uh, make it clear that this, to all the individuals that are the underlings, it could happen to you any time. It's never safe. And, you know, and it's making you sick all the time because you're worried about it. And, and it has to be random. If it's predictable, then you can adjust to it. You don't want to adjust to it. You want it to have maximum impact, so you want it to be unpredictable. If it's unpredictable, you're always stressed out about it. And so you're, you're going to get sick from it and so on. So there's a lot of studies along that line. So, yeah, there, there's that too. The randomness of it versus predictable, maybe. Um, hey, so what do you, you, you look like you're thinking deeply about a lot of stuff. Do you want to say something? <laughs> Okay. If I could go bring back to your microaggression point, it seems to me, that, and I was thinking about it, maybe the problem about aggressions is not what happens 
but the time it affects your life. In other words, uh, a, a guy comes and you know it hits you seriously, and you're sort of shaken for a few days. So you've lost a few days of your real life before you sort of forget it. Mm -hmm. If you have microaggression, maybe it bothers you for 20 minutes. But if you have lots of microaggressions, the sum of the time of your life where you're damaged may be much longer yeah. than that single event. Right. So that's an engineer's way of yes. and uh, it might also doing be the that, math. It might also be an accumulation that <coughs> you're more <coughs> sensitive to the possibility that another, another microaggression can occur. Mm -hmm. And so the damage may be, maybe, the integral might be much yeah, bigger. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, 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 we, we could go on like that. But uh, Jeanette, you, you, did you want to do yeah, something? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering because I'm a person of action and you know discussing things without any kind of solution. I'm just wondering um, what is your game plan? What is the exact goal and how exactly do you plan on achieving that? Yeah. Um, well, today I wanted to give a theoretical <clears> talk. <throat> you know, this this was my chance to offer reflections and to try to give a vision and to get people. Um, thinking about the ideas as part of uh, the framework that would help you to make sense of all this craziness that's happening, right? So today was my kind of time out for just reflection. I didn't, I didn't, you know, that, it, that's what it was. It was like, hey, kids, let's, you know, you're in kindergarten, you walk in, let's have coloring day, you know, whatever. So it was, that was my uh, idea, and I was hoping that the reflection because I know that a lot of us in our society are trained to uh, like to analyze and have ideas. Okay, a lot of the students, I, uh, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. I'm not suggesting it's a good thing, but it is, it is a reality of our society. And so I want to offer that to get people interested in the ideas and thinking about it and maybe identifying some of these problems and then maybe thinking for themselves, okay, yeah, I should do something about this, which is why I, I suggested, you know, get involved somehow. So, um, I don't have any direct suggestions other than, <laughs> other than, I think, if you're in a position where you can slap someone hard for being stupid, then do it. <laughs> <laughs> What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in, 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 if you can get, a, you know, do it. Try to choose circumstances where you'll get away with it, and where <laughs> no, seriously, and where they will suffer the consequences. Like they'll be humiliated. They'll be, uh, you know, they'll, they'll not want to do this ever again. Um, so, in in but your everyday life, and, and you know, it's somebody it's, who thinks that they're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that not oppressing them in their point of view? And then say, say again. If you're humiliating somebody who thinks they're right, are you not oppressing them in their point of view? Yeah, and, and I would they say not stand up to you. And yeah, yeah, no, but this you? personal. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying oppression's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it's going to be there no matter what. Yeah. And so. So the you know, just accept it. No, I'm not. No, no, no. <laughs> so no, no, no there, there's oppression from there's. There is oppression from the dominance hierarchy that you may want to resist. There is undue, disproportionate violence and oppression that happens, that is even, shouldn't even happen in a working dominance hierarchy, okay, that you certainly want to fight. And there's you fighting back. Now, I wouldn't think of that as oppression because I, when, when I see the individual fighting back against an organized system, I see that as resistance, not oppression, right? So, um, I see that as, as pushback. I, I, the word oppression for me ha implies kind of the system, you know? That, that's, when I use it, that's what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking about the system, you know? You're, the system, the cop, the cop is going to viciously manhandle you, throw you to the ground, cuff you, push your head against the pavement, scratch you, not let you go to Washington for a long time, hold you out in the cold before he puts you in his car, do all this stuff to you, hold you, and everything, and then charge you for assaulting him, and charge you for things you didn't do, and et cetera, et cetera. And then 
in addition to that, the judge is going to agree with the cop most of the time. <laughs> and is going to, so you're going to get doubly punished. So you're at the wrong place at the wrong time. All this stuff's going to happen to you. Yeah. And so that I see as systemic oppression, right? Um, if, and, and, you know, the individual has very little defense against that stuff. That's really heavy duty cranking the machine out. To, they decided you're the target and you're, you're going to eat it, you know? Um, yeah, but what but if you don't care? If you don't care to get... Yeah, what if they beat the hell out of you? you don't care. What does that mean to have on you? Yeah, that's, well, that's one way to do it. And if you don't care so much about it, and you can defend yourself in terms of speaking out, as you have done. In and, and you look at the person and you tell them you're a piece of shit, and that's how I beat you and will always beat you. Is exactly. That how can they oppress you? Right. So you 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 happen to personally be a very powerful individual in terms of defending yourself. You were able to reach out to influential people. You were able to find ways to communicate to them. You were able to write your story in a compelling way, you know, you've got a book that people can read and say, holy crap, this should never happen, you know? And so you were able to do all these things despite this very vicious violence against you, you know, you're put into segregation, you're put into prison for years for, for a crime you didn't commit and so on. Um, and that's a wonderful thing and I think that you as a person can survive that violence largely because you were able to find those ways to defend yourself. Look, they were trying to control me through violence. The whole reason why they were trying to control me to begin with is because they can't control this in here. And because they know I don't give a fuck about, uh, because I actually don't, I look at the system right. and I see it as completely useless. Right. In order for me to actually buy into any of this stuff, I actually have to buy in and believe it. And right. I don't. So they just keep beating me and beating me more right. to buy into this. To do this, I'm dominant, and I look at them and I go, well, not to me, not in my world, so it doesn't matter. And then all I want to do is physically get me more, and, yes. and until they give up. And, and, and which hopefully they'll give up. Yeah. And then anyone tries, because it's all, it's yeah. all individual. Yeah. It, it is all individual, I, in a system. I think you, you shared once that the reason the courts were so um, uh, against you, were so um, behaved the way they did, which was found to be improper on appeal, is that you had this attitude. It didn't matter whether you were innocent or guilty. The fact that you had the attitude that I'm innocent and there's nothing you can do about it, there's nothing you can do to me, that attitude, I think, pissed them off. They were wrong. So, right. I, I, you know. Right. So <laughs> that, that, that's a very common what thing. What makes them, be, they know they're wrong and that makes them lower in their own eyes. Yes. Because yes. they know that they're wrong. Yes. So they know that I'm above them. So it and we, matter. and, in our society now, the police, it wasn't this way 20 years ago, but now the police have this training that the first priority is to subdue the person. If you've decided to arrest them, guilty or not, you have made the decision to arrest them, they have to entirely comply with every directive that they give. If they talk back, absolutely it does. If they talk back, if you say, sir, I want you to kneel down and put your hands behind your back, and they say, why would I do that? Then they're trained to increase the violence to get them to comply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did not comply immediately. Their training is you increase the violence. You, 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 you rack it up a notch. If they don't yeah. comply again, you rack it up a notch again. They have a wheel where they rack it up all the way up all and it way ends. All the way they feel so stupid. I know, but that's what they're doing. That's how they're trained. Mm -hmm. that's and the, end the, 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 end, the end of the, the, the wheel is violent force, they kill you, yep. okay? So you've got the taser, you've got, you've got, there's a part of the wedge of the wheel that says the baton comes out, you know, and you whack them hard with this baton, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. And at the end, if you're, if you're still fighting back, whatever, they kill you, okay? Right. This is how they, this is, this is how they're yeah. trained. This is how they're trained. So there's no common sense, there's no negotiating. Mm -hmm. The first Very. thing that comes out in the training is this crap about violence. And this is a military occupation type training that didn't exist before. It used to be about common sense. And now they've implemented that and that's what they're doing. That's how they're behaving. So as you say, it leads to some absurdities because sometimes they'll be uh, using disproportionate force, right? Just because you were talking back and so on. But you're still, you're, you're in a... You're in a 
difficult position, right? But what does it mean in life in the end? Hmm? In the end, what does it mean in life? I mean, honestly, I've gone through all this stuff, but I also know I've lived a friggin' full life, and if I went the other way, like going to the university and being an academic, I probably wouldn't be fulfilled with my life at all. At least I know I could die. As I can day. tell you, you wouldn't. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> we have we, we have shared experience. Probably be a completely like, different person. I, I need to see so about people that I understand. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, no, I can do that. I think that we can uh, probably continue uh, the discussions informally and in groups and things, but feel free to, to leave, but I think it might be a good time to stop. We've been going on, it's 10 now, and we said we have the room for 10, so it's been really great. You've been a great, great crowd. Thank you very much.